and welcome to the next episode of Cylinder Radio. I'm your host, Will Roosh, high school teacher in Los Angeles, trying to model the processes that we go through when we're trying to think, think our way through the world. And, uh, and my guest today, I'm really excited to talk to, um, is Brittany Talissa King. I found her after I had um, an experience on social media with Ibram Kendi. I made a comment uh, about Ibram Kendi uh, on his page and he responded. And my comment was essentially, uh, he is unwilling to engage with people like John McWhorter, Chloe Valdery, Coleman Hughes, et cetera. And he responded with, well, they misrepresent my ideas. And I thought, well, that's a great opportunity then to clear it up. I would love to see it. I would love to see that interaction. And a lot of people were mad at me for, for suggesting that and things. And then I found one of Brittany's videos where she was saying something very similar of, I would like to see the conversation. And so I started following her. And um, one of the, the thing I, th I think that um, is most inspiring about what you're doing, Brittany, is, is you are sharing your process, your process of going you know, through these very divided times and a lot of these tricky t concepts and stuff is you're sharing as you're learning. And as teachers, we always try to say that we are promoting being lifelong learners, but I am shocked at how many teachers are so closed-minded and are not willing to go through the very disruptive process of education and learning for yourself and everything like that. So I just wanna say thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. And can you introduce yourself, um, just like a quick bio about who you are, You know what got you into this kind of space of talking about all of these controversial issues and mm -hmm. things like that? Um, well, first off, thank you for inviting me on. This is awesome. And I'm glad that you've been sharing my stuff and my process because it's been a process and it's been relatively new. But my name is Brittany Slissy King. I'm from Columbus, Indiana, small hometown in um, Midwest. It's actually Mike Pence's hometown. So very conservative, very oh. re Republican. Um, and in 2018, I went to NYU and studied journalism and I was concentrated in cultural reporting and criticism. And formally before that, I actually organized the Black Lives Matter chapter for two years. So from 2016 to 2018, um, basically when Donald Trump became president, uh, that was around the time that I started BLM. And it was right after Alton Sterling and Philando Castile uh, were murdered back to back within 24 hours yeah. and that was a real trying time that was a learning process and that got me actually to where i am now in this heterodox space i guess uh, with my voice and i'm i'm still figuring it out but what got me interested was how i realized how i was I would think about things and how it really was tied to an identity, how it was tied to my exterior, how when I would go through the process of interrogating and challenging um, certain issues or matters, deep down I would feel like I felt this way about it, but because I was black or a woman or whatever, I felt like, well, I can't say this because this goes against my identity. But then when I really started to interrogate that notion is when I realized that identity politics stifles thought, like really can stifle it. Not to say that um, to identify as black means you're totally off the grid of, of being able to be a critical thinker, but to say that it can get in the way, like the emotional tie to it can get to, in the way of trying to make sense of an idea in an objective sense. So I've been on that journey for a year now since, since I've graduated NYU. It was after I graduated NYU is when I got into this space. It took a while, but. Yeah, the identity one's an interesting one. I've had on four um, very diverse uh, transgendered individuals on my podcast. And one of the things that I've found is two of them were activists and then two of them were not. And the ones that were not, it was interesting. I had Corinna Cohn and um, Luca uh, Eichlodine. And, you know, Luca is like a cook and a chef. And Corinna is a computer, uh, computer engineer. 
and like their identity when you say like you know what what's your identity it's like well i'm a chef and um you know i'm a computer engineer and i'm a this this and i'm trans and it's like one of the many as opposed mm. to the um uh um the two other individuals that i had um lex and danny they their their primary thing is their transgenderism like that's their primary identity marker uh you know and i just i wonder how that plays out like is it is there like a hierarchy of how you identify like me like do i identify mo most as like a teacher as a father as a white guy as a male like mm. and and i wonder how much like in identity politics it's like well you 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 are these categories so therefore you know that should be like on the forefront of your mind does that make sense yeah i think that the best way it's funny because I was just talking about something similar to this um, with a friend today. And we kind of, and you might know this person, but I'm not going to say who it is. But anyway, um, and he was saying, well, he agreed on me on some things because I know, like I've said, um, I've disassociated from the national BLM, but I do still have hopes that they can change things around. It's really not, um, it's the national BLM that I have a problem with, but Black Lives Mattering and that notion is still things I carry with me in my work. And so if I say that I might not, there's two, there's two identities within the Black, with being Black, I feel. There's a racial identity and there's an ethnic, ethnic one. And I think the racial identity is what happened to us, what uh, was manufactured, like the racial category we were thrown into without our consent. Like, you know, in 1790, when they said, okay, this is gonna be what's black and this is what's white, that is a racial identity, like the, the marker of our oppression and, and things of that nature. Ethnic identity is what we did despite our racial identity, like our culture, our, our music, our dance, our colloquialisms, our progression from 1790, from 1619. So when I say I'm black, that is what I mean when I say I'm black, my ethnic identity. Yeah. And so when I think about myself though, I really think first, and this isn't Sunday, so I'm not gonna go into like a, a sermon, but I, I am someone that believes in Jesus Christ. So that actually helps me really critically think in a way where I am not thinking for me. Like I'm not trying to get to a solution where it suits me. Like sometimes yeah. I get to a solution that pisses me off, but I'm like, that's the truth though. So I have to deal with it. And that actually helps me center because before the, the check and balances was my identity. If it doesn't check and balance with being black or a woman or being this, this, then it's wrong. But now it's like this, but my center is, is more so like God, like that's what I check and balance with. If that makes sense. It, that makes so, a lot. That makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. So like, if I want to write a post about on Twitter, it's funny because I've, I've been in my emotions. Right. And I'm, I might write something and it might be actually true, but will it translate to people that they can hear it? Or are they going, or it's just one side going to be like, yeah, that sounds good. And the other side's going to be like, you're this, this. But I have heard feedback from a lot of people who are not necessarily, that might be on the right or on the left, far left, far right, whatever, and still find truth in what I'm saying because they realize I'm not saying it to be divisive or abrasive or dismissive. Like, I'm really sincere when I say it. Um, and you can see this on my YouTube channel, like American Shade. Like you said, I critiqued Kendi and I hope in a way where I wasn't being patronizing or anything to him, but a literal, like you have, you're at the helm of a movement that is taking over, literally over America and society. And to debate with someone else that might not agree with you actually can help your followers get a holistic view of what's going on and not just your view like why would you want to be the only voice people listen to why wouldn't you want to talk and if and like you said like if someone's misrepresenting you i'll, I'll be the first one there if someone wasn't 
representing my work like to what it was and they wanted to bait me, I would be there in a second. So I'm like, there's something odd about that to me. Um, and so I made that video. And then on my on my YouTube channel, you'll see that. You'll see me talking about Tana C. Coates and how much I love him. And you'll see me talk about the Capitol and what I really believe about that. And and I don't cater to any side. I don't cater like what if it comes out and it sounds more liberal than it is. If it comes out and it sounds more conservative, it is. It's not up to me. But I make sure I take a lot of time before I say things. Like before I make content, before and that's why when I am talking, I literally am in the process when I'm talking to people. And I'm not afraid to do that because I don't, I'm a student. And I think that's what's lost. Some people feel like, you know, tie, button up. Like I have to be the one that like had it all figured out. And I'm kind of trying to humanize the process of critical thinking that is not reserved for these, you know, elite intellectuals everyone can do this and it, and it's and it is kind of scary to do it the way i am doing it i mean sort of not now like i don't really care now but at first i'm like i don't know any other way but to do it i cannot act like i have the answer so that's not me like so. i think it's i think it's the best way I, I mean again this is it came out of necessity for me because i i was in i started finding myself in rooms where people were a lot smarter than me and I was like, all right, well, then I just got to get really curious. And I just got to, you know, be open that if you do put something on your YouTube channel and it's wrong, I'm sure that you're like me and you'd be like, tell me how it's wrong. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I don't want to walk around with bad ideas ever. It's like, mm -hmm. that's the thing that really rubs me the wrong way with some of the people. And, and, and I love the way that you said that you're not, you're, you're hoping that they course correct. Because Ibram Kendi is running the Center for Anti-Racist Research at Boston University. Like, don't we need really good social science to, to, to study racism? Like, I think that's really important, but I worry that it's not research because he already has an agenda for what he wants the, the data to, to expose. And I, and I hope I'm wrong about that. Same thing with BLM is like, like how that started, you're talking about Philandra Castile, like that's, I mean, they're, they're Sandra Bland, Philandra Castile, Eric Gardner, I mean, there's so many that when you look at what happened, it's like, it's, it's heartbreaking, it's crushing. And you go, oh my God, how, this is something that needs to be fixed. It's so important. And yet if they do it wrong, it won't be. And I don't know what right is, but if, if these organizations, these movements do it wrong, it can have a perverse unintended consequence and it could make things worse. It could turn people against your cause. Where when George Floyd was killed, like everyone, Sean Hannity on, on Fox News, like the Trump sycophant was like, oh, that's such a tragic situation. Like we are all together and and then it, we let it slip through our fingers. And it was such a, an opportunity that was missed. And I hope we have less and less of those. Yeah. I really see Black Lives Matter as two different phases, though. I see, like, in 2013, when uh, Patrice Coolers, one of the founders, when she tweeted out the hashtag Black Lives Matter after George Zimmerman's acquittal, and then it, you know, the rest is history right there. And it became an organization. That was its more most organic and authentic place. And they had very like clear principles. And the main one was anti-police brutality. That was the number one thing. And three years later, I mean, actually I was on board like before that. I was in college, I was doing die-ins, I was doing protests and things like that. But in 2016, it was still like that. It was around 2017, no, about 2018 is when things started to shift. And I think it started to shift, honestly, because with the blessing of getting a lot of funds to make change, then again, when you have a lot of funding, a lot of those corporations try to like take control. Uh -huh. And I think that they tried to take um, control of how the organization was steering. And well, I'll leave that there on the table. We won't go there. But um, how these how the organizations was was going and i realized things started to change like the objectives started to be ambiguous like and the focus starts to be almost everything and i'm like well yeah maybe these organizations are like since i gave you 10 million i want some of this in there okay i gave you this and they're like okay i mean they might and at first i'm sure like we can take this on and on but then when you take on so many little things it just becomes something that wasn't and 
then George Floyd happened. But the thing is, is BLM was kind of dormant. It wasn't gone, but dormant. Maybe that's, it was probably not necessarily bad because there wasn't a lot of killings, I guess, happening during that time. It was really a lot during 2016, 2017. But then when George died, I mean, that was like, I mean, the world mm-hmm. had an uproar. And then, of course, BLM came out. And then, B, and I was getting really, I was still cynical, not with BLM, but with, with who was helping BLM. I was like, I hope this turns out good. And then I start seeing the world get, like, participate. I was like, okay, this is different. And I'm in. Like, I'm like, I was, you know, you know, uh, I wasn't an organizer then, but I still was like amplifying Black Lives Matters and and people in it that were doing like good work and grassroots chapters that people never knew about, like all that. Yeah. Then I think because of all of the attention that Black Lives Matter got, and this has less to do about the chapters and the grassroots and all of the people, it's the people on top. I feel like they saw, wow, we have the world that loves this name that used to be polarizing. And then what did you see? Corporations were like Netflix and like all, all of these corporations using this as like a trendy symbol. And it became less about activism and more about here's a way to show that I'm not the problem. I'm not racist. It was like you're you're buying into like this moral currency, not to do anything, but to say if I post this on my stuff, then I'm I'm good, I'm clean. Yeah. And with that, it becomes a business. And I think that's when things turn. And then people get so uh, entitled, and people have this false sense of, of power. They feel like. Now we have control of the narrative. And then what we see, we saw people in Washington, DC, um, and I would call them rogue chapters. I don't think this is not what the national, or this is not what like the three black women who started Black Lives Matter, I'm sure they didn't say, go out and tell white people to put up their fists. And if they don't, then they're white supremacists. Like those were those chapters, but unfortunately they share the same name. So that spreads and taints everyone. And when the national BLM did not denounce that, that is when I started to part ways. Cause I'm like, it's not, it's not the people who started, it's someone above them who is being like, no, this is actually good. Like, I feel like that it's, it's, it's turning into something where one does not care about black lives. Like the, the, the people and the power don't care. The people on the ground, I feel, do care, but they're fighting a battle that the top isn't trying to fix. Because, There's a lack of leadership, right? I mean, I mean that's one of the things Daryl yeah. Davis, I've had him on my podcast twice. Are you familiar with Daryl Davis? Yeah, the musician. He's amazing, yeah. yeah He's yeah. awesome. And, yeah. And he, um, and he was saying like, you know, there's a lack of like leadership and you know, anyone, I could start a Black Lives Matter chapter. I mean, I'd like, because it's just like the name, it wouldn't be official, but it could still happen. And so you get all kinds of different people kind of coming into that. You know, I want to ask you, what was the initial thing? Um, and I don't, I don't like the term red pill. That's like, but like, what was I, the initial- I honestly, uh, okay, two things. I yeah. hate that word. I know. And what is it? Like what? Like oh, when I hear matrix, red pill. I think. Okay. I think it's from the matrix. It's like, you can either go out into like, you know, the, the make believe world with the blue pill, or you can find out what reality is with the red pill. But Candace Owens kind of took that and took it as the red being like Republican. And, and what, I guess what I'm, what I, what I'm intrigued by with you is there's a lot of people that go from Candace Owens just being one example, but like went from like, says she was on the left, then she went to the right or Dave Rubin, another one, like, you know, left, then to right, like switching from one ideology to another. And then you have all, you have from all of these blind spots get, get exposed. You go, oh my gosh, they got exposed by this side. I better go to this side. And then you just open up a whole bunch of new blind spots as opposed to being more heterodox of like, all right, I don't know. I'm going to try and pick a little bit from here, a little bit from here. But what was the catalyst? Like at what point did you start to just like question and 
can you take us through a little bit of like that? It's a disrupting process. I went through it a lot when I married into like a different culture and stuff of like the things that I thought were true might not be. And even like when it comes to morality and all this kind of stuff, just, you just get into a, t a like a head, like a, your head just starts spinning. And you're like, I don't know what up and down is, blah, blah, blah. Can you just, what, what, what was that? What was like the, was it a slow process? Was it an instant thing that gets you to, to kind of break out of kind of an orthodox place to a more like uncertain place, I suppose? Yeah, it was not quick at all. Hmm. Um, it's funny. It's funny you bring up whatever, Ruben. Yeah. I don't, yeah, like that quick of a switch is not, doesn't feel authentic to me, but whatever. I'll leave him alone. And now people's after yeah. him. Um, I guess. Awesome. But for me, no, it was, right. yeah, it was very slow because my, what I was believing was accumulation of decades how can you switch that off? Like, oh, like, okay, one person said something. So it's, no, it took a lot of me really, like truly allowing thoughts to kind of just rip me apart in a way where I was like, I'm either going to be all in to, f okay, so I'll just talk about the catalyst. The catalyst was my last polemic that I wrote at NYU and it was actually on Thomas Chatterson Williams and I wrote a polemic against his work mm. and the polemic was well written but the argument was very weak because I I straw man his arguments I straw man his work mm. I basically wrote him with like his hands tied behind his back he had no chance to win in this this piece but the thing is, is I showed my own weakness there. And when I was talking to my professor and we did a workshop and I had my, I had my whole behind handed to me there. Like I, the, it, and it was, it, it, the thing is, is I really thought everyone in the room was crazy. Like when people were like, right. well, this, this, yeah. this, this, and my teacher who, um, my director, she, her name's Katie Rofi. She's, awesome and i'm sure people know her she's a culture critic and writer author awesome person okay. um she's white too i don't know if that matters probably does to some people but um she we had a great rapport and i would even say friendship <clears throat> but she was really disappointed with me in this piece because she was just like you're kind of showing your hand here like you're you're i read this and i see your vendetta against thomas and not his work like you have a problem with him and what he says and I'm like I do but I didn't think I showed it so then I was like well why do I have a problem with him like why this this is this and so it was during that workshop process and like me thinking all of my friends in here are racist wow my teacher's racist like this is crazy how they can't how they're arguing against this piece how they don't see its validity blah blah, blah. but then when I went back and I and I edited again for the final piece and i was like you have to just read his work as if you aren't a fan of tanasi coast because the work i was critiquing was um on coats and then other stuff i'm like read it like try to read it like you're not black try to read it like you're not a fan of tana like and it i mean obviously it wasn't perfect but the more i kind of gave space the more i really kind of understood him on a human level to where I actually strong manned his, his work. Yeah. And the polemic was one of my best pieces because I still didn't agree with a lot of stuff he said, but then there were things that I said, you know what? I don't necessarily agree with it, but it makes sense. And when I would put that in there, people would be like, okay, she doesn't really have a dog in a fight to take him down. She's just showing things that she disagrees with. But then when I graduated and I said, okay, all of my friends were racist. <laughs> my teacher wasn't. When I took the critiques and I redid this, I did better and I know it was better. Not because I got a great grade, but it was better. I'm like, but why did I allow myself to get so like emotionally involved in this in a way where I was in my way of my own thoughts? And I started just saying, okay, I have to go and I have to start listening to people that I 
figuratively threw in the trash. And so I start listening to Shelby Still. Mm. That took a long time to, whatever. I just start listening to them. Not to say I'm like, listen to them and believe them. No. No, but you turned but, into the storm, Brittany. Like, that's what I'm trying to, mm-hmm. like, you, when, when you're presented with, with um, things that are very hard to, to, very difficult things, very, like, pain, mentally painful things, because it's just, like, exposing you and stuff, a lot of people run from that storm, and you decide to, to do a 180 and run right into it. And if we can if we can promote that more in society, it's going to have just, it's just going to be exponentially better for all of us, but it's, you have to be willing. I mean, is it, is it your personality? Are you just more of like a, like a fighter, like a rebellious type of person? Like, what is it? Are you just a naturally curious person? Like, what is it to get you to go instead of getting this grade, instead of sticking to, you know what, the teacher's wrong. This is wrong. I'm going out of my day. You're going to go, I'm going to chat. I'm going to, I'm going straight for it. You know, like, yeah. I'm gonna try and capture that in a bottle and and send it out. I don't know. How, I don't know what that is. I'm all of those things. Yeah. I am a troublemaker. I'm kidding. Um, I I'm definitely curious. So I'm a very curious person, um, and that's actually one of the things I put in my um, essay to get into NYU was I'm I I wrote like and because my program was cultural reporting and criticism. So we're going to analysis and critique. And I was just like, I am so curious. I always want to get to the why of something. And then after I get to the why of something, I'm like, but there's some other why underneath. Like, I'm like, there's always some more stuff. So that's just my personality. I'm curious. I don't see things at a surface level. I always go deep. But I realized with certain things like race, I was not going deep enough. Like, I felt because I was Black, I had the answer, to be real. Like, I'm like, I'm Black, I know I don't have, I don't even have to say nothing. I can say I'm Black. Right? Yeah, I could say I'm Black. black. Yeah. I'm like, I can say I'm Black and that's it. And the thing is, it's like, in some cases, I do think it's true. But in other cases, to really try to explain to someone that's not Black your side or your thought, like, that's not it's not good enough to stay surface level. Like you have to go way deeper. And I had no problem going deeper on other things, but race was something I felt like I didn't have to go deep on. Mm, okay. And then that's when I realized I had to with someone that was black who decided like, I'm an ex black man, I'm unraveling race. And I felt like, well, you can't do that. You, you can't do that. And I'm like, to be real, why can't he do that? Yeah. Like he can do that. And it, even if I don't agree with it, he doesn't have to be called like names or he doesn't have to be called, you know, like he can be his own person and decide that if he wants. Um, but that's a whole different, I mean, we'll go into why people do that. Um, whatever. But um, I kind of lost train of thought. I do this a lot. No, it's okay. Yeah, no, I understand. No, I just, I, I just, that's, that's I, the most that's the most beneficial, I think, element of, of what you're doing, what I'm trying to do with Heterodox Academy and everything like that. It's, it's all about just trying to spark that curiosity in people. People are so sure, and I understand it, and I've talked a lot about tribalism and you know, the way social psychology works. I understand it, but I still want to try and share stories about people who decide to turn into that storm. In mm-hmm. doing some research for this, I found something. I, I think I probably agree with you on a lot. But I found something that I might disagree with you on when it comes to race. And I want to see if I want to dig in a little bit. Um, Colorblindness. I heard you talking about, um, you said, you know, the idea that we could someday have like a colorblind society, you don't think that that's gonna gonna come. And is that that like fair representation of what you said? Um, Was that the piece, our skin problem? I don't remember. It it was. Okay. Yeah. But go ahead. That was basically what I, well, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, so just just to get the pushback that I have is I, it might, maybe not, but I believe it's possible in here. And I, just because of two personal experiences I have. One is I taught in a couple of schools that were very, very diverse. So there were Hispanic kids, black kids, Jewish kids, Asian kids, white kids, whatever, there was a mixed. And after the first week, if a kid, like if you would say a kid's name, and I would be able to tell you about that kid, but I would struggle. And still looking back, there are times where I struggle and I don't remember, I don't remember the kid's race. 
Like I remember their personality. I remember the things that happened, but like, you know how you, you'll remember like your friend getting like, you know, almost hit by a car, but if they, they say, what color was that car? You're like, I don't remember, but I see it so clearly. Was it green? Wait, might, maybe it was blue. I don't know. Like I had that experience. And then another one is just raising my kids who's they're six and three and they don't care about skin color. They have, we have pretty diverse friends and stuff like that over the house all the time. They, they just don't, they don't see it. So I wonder if, as, if maybe it would take some generations, but I don't notice, you know, people's hair color with any kind of like um, significance to it or eye color or, or things like that. Maybe I'm just more <laughs> ignorant to things. Um, that could be, definitely be it that I'm just, I'm just a little clueless walking around the world, but though I believe that it's possible. And maybe I'm wrong. So I'm curious what your, what your thoughts are on this. Um, so that piece is very funny because there's people who commented and said that you indirectly made a case for colorblindness in this piece. And I was like, I think I actually did on accident mm -hmm. because I know I ended on like talking about that we should do what Dr. King said and, you know, judge by the content of someone's character or not, you know, the composition of their skin or whatever. Um, and then I was, and I was showing how, how race, of course, arbitrary it is, but how it's like so fragile. Like I was showing like in the, in, you know, historically with passing, how, how black people would pass as white for safety mm -hmm. um, and, and for access to things. Um, and then I would show now, like there's, there's white women passing as black and then there's other people deciding that they don't want to be anything. And then they're kind of like ambiguous. And then there's, and I'm like, there's so many blind spots with race to where if you can come up with a good disguise, meaning like how you talk, dress, how you wear your hair, you can really be any race if you're light skinned enough or if you you know you can pass right so in a way i was showing how race was inescapable which it is but race is also so like it can collapse so now with color blindness i would say it's funny that you you kind of talk about color blindness in a literal sense like i literally didn't see the or not see I don't remember. Yeah, like, like like in the literal sense of like I I am seeing people as who they are, not kind of what they are. And I've experienced I, that myself. But again, it might be because I'm a little dense, so it might just be me. But I've experienced that, and I remember specifically kids talking and I'd be like, I don't remember what race they were because it was such a mixed group, and there were skater kids who were black, and there were you know rappers who were white, and like it was it was such a it was it was so it was these I taught in some pretty cool spots that were really mixed. Their friends it wasn't clicky with friends and segregated at all. So they just became the kid. Oh, that kid's an a hole. <laughs> like doesn't I didn't yeah. think about. Yeah, it's very literal. I, yeah, yeah, literal. So for me, I I I always. I don't think it's anything wrong with seeing race. It's how you how you see it. Sure. Um, if that is how you dictate how you're going to treat someone obviously no for me though i mean yes i see i see race and i'm curious about people's cultures and stuff so that's a uh, signifier of a difference there that's not bad but more like i okay let's talk about this or like if they see me i have no problem talking about my culture or whatever um but I want colorblindness in the sense of how we treat each other and how we're fighting for the sense of equality. I don't think with equality, you can have a thing of critical race theory that always puts people above and below, which I know they don't think this, but when you're telling kids and you're telling children at like what seven, eight, that they're racist because they're white, and then basically whispering to the black kids, "Well, you're inferior because you're black." Like that already sets a precedent for their life. And when I was seven, 
or eight or whatever, like I didn't feel inferior. Now I did have my first experience with racism when I was seven. Um, that's when I realized there's a difference between being black and white. Like obviously I knew I wasn't white. Can you but share that with us? Just like what that experience was? Uh, it was it's funny. It was not funny, but oh I don't know. It's not but <laughs> kids are kids. But um so I again was I went to um an all white school and there was probably ten black kids in my in my sixth grade class at this time. Or no sixth grade. What am I talking about sixth grade? Anyway, when I was seven, I go off, dude, and it's late over here, so we know. No, no, no. Um, but like first grade, but, maybe something like that. Yeah, first grade, but um, but so every grade, I was usually the only black kid, or there's only mm. two other black kids. But I remember Spice Girls became a thing, and it was like 1996, and it was like Spice Girls was a thing, and I everyone had <laughs> yes, and. I went, someone had the CD and they're passing around and everyone was like, oh, this one's so pretty. Oh, this one. I'm like, I love her dress. Everyone's just like going like hysterical. I remember that moment. And I was like, they're all pretty. And I'm like, I like her. And then he's like, and then my best friend, Derek, who was black or who was white was like, no, I don't like this one. She's ugly. And I was, and he's pointing to Mel B, Scary Spice. Yeah. And I'm like, why is she ugly? And he's like, cause she's black. And I was like, say what i'm like I, and then that's when it clicked i'm like well i'm black and he and so am i ugly because i'm black and i didn't say this out loud but i was internally like that's weird yeah, and then sense. yeah so then when you so when you feel this isolated feeling right of okay i just feel like you know i was called ugly in a way because i am also not only am I black, I'm darker than her. So am I a lot uglier than her? And so when you look, so I remember looking around when I was seven and then really realizing I'm the only black kid here. I don't have someone I can talk to about, about this. And that is when I kind of realized, okay, there's a difference between my experience and being white. Mm. And I think it's true. Definitely, there's different. I mean, not think there, it is true. It's a different experience with every race in this country on how you're going to experience the world. But I think with someone treating like if I could only imagine if a critical race theory was implemented in my school, how it would make things way worse. It would not make things better. It would make the my peers pity me. For being black like i have to be nice to you because you're black and because yeah. i'm white and i'm just so better like they're not because that's not what they're teaching but in a sense it's kind of what you're saying we saw that like, a lot we, this summer a lot yeah yeah and so i think that how i was treated in elementary school at least was mainly colorblind ish with with my peers of course they saw my race right, like, right but but was there like i'm not gonna hang out with you because you're black no it was, it was yeah and of course think people say little things about it and that's just that's that's life in a sense of you can't end racism but it doesn't mean you have to put up with it and i certainly didn't and i don't mm -hmm. um i know racism isn't going to end that's not a, that's not possible but don't try me though <laughs> like don't like you can't say something to me, but unfortunately it's, it's tied to an emotion and it's like wanting to end being mean or wanting to end greed. Racism actually is that kind of emotion that's just here. Yeah. So you mentioned critical race theory. I'm in, and especially in schools, that's like my area. And I'm actually in the process of writing a book about it. Cause there's a lot of parents that reach out to me that are like, my kid's learning this. How do I talk back to it? And, and, schools are just like defending it because it's anti-racist so you can't push back against anti-racist it's like then you know fill in the blank it's like well, so so silly brilliantly uh labeled and stuff but you know i really have prejudiced feelings toward woke people it's very interesting like 
I should read, I, I, I love learning about polarization and the division and stuff. And Ezra Klein wrote a book, Why We're Polarized. And I don't want to read it because I just lose respect for people that are woke. You know, like, just like whatever wokeness is, people that are like on that camp that were like, you know, put the black box up, you better have the black box up, or why don't you have the black box up? Or, you know, this, just given the, the, the fist, no matter what, like Black Lives Matter, but like, what are you doing? Like the wokeness, I really am prejudiced. And I don't like being prejudiced, but I just, I just lose respect for people that have it, which sucks for me because I'm missing out on some really smart people that just have this one bad, you know, what I would perceive as a bad idea that they're holding on to. And I don't like it, but I just, I'm aware of that in me. Mm. I lose respect for people that are, that are really on that, on, in that camp and unwilling to, to venture out of it at all. Do you think wokeness only lives on the, on the left? I think in this iteration of it, it the, like the idea of like, like through like critical race theory and stuff like that. And then I think that there's the ideological blind spots on the right, especially like now, like the, the, the Trumpy kind of MAGA crew. Um, and I don't like, I don't, I don't like it, people who are ideologically possessed, that they have this ideology and they're going to stick with that one. And they're unwilling to engage with things. Like I have my own ideologies. Like, I don't talk about it much, but I'm Christian too. And like, I, I love, re I read a ton of atheist books. I read a lot of Sam Harris and I read Hitchens and I read all this stuff because I love challenging it because Every time I have, it's actually made personally just for me, like me being more of like a believer, more of someone who says this is a this is a good operating system for my life. And mm -hmm. I've taught I'm friends with a lot of very prominent atheists and stuff like that. And it's it's like cool, you do your thing, I do my thing, but I'm not scared to engage with that kind of stuff. So I would say that exists on the left and the right, but even with my ideologies, I am always open to challenging them especially when it comes to Christianity, I just feel like it, it, it'll it, not to get like too like religious. Cause I know I have a lot of like diverse people listening that aren't religious, but like, I just believe that my faith will hold up. If it can't hold yeah. up to whatever Sam Harris, then it's, it, it shouldn't say so just like anything else. It's a, if it's a bad idea and, and a really, if Bill Maher can convince me that, you know, taking my kids to church and reading the Bible and stuff like that is bad, then I'll, I'll let it go. But I'm, I'll just have, mm -hmm faith that it won't yeah yeah i'm uh, well with what you just said and then i'll talk about wokeness but like with i so yeah i said i i'm believing jesus christ um i have no issue with listening i have a lot of friends that are atheists um i, I have christopher hitchens too on my shelf mm -hmm. uh particularly i found it interesting that how christopher hitchens in the book i have of these essays how he talked about Dr. King and how he said he was one of the most, he was one of the best speech writers and uh, thinkers. And, and Dr. King's a very prominent Christian and preacher. And just with that, like he has no problem with just objectively like, like Dr. King's the GOAT. Doesn't mean I believe in, in God but he is like what he's saying is is great so yeah i have the same thing like i listen to sam harris and i and i listen to other people not because they're atheists but i might find out they're atheists afterwards and i still don't care because my faith is strong so it's like you. you can convince me that i'm an asian woman before you can convince me there's no god like i really like i don't care what anyone says i'm like i know he's real and it's not because of just like the bible it's like an actual experience but anyway this is not sunday and this is not the sanctuary <laughs> but like but with wokeness it's like I, I i do think wokeness is predominantly we see it on the on the left or used on the left which is like used against the left, but then some of the left people do say they're woke. So it's like, you know, whatever. But I definitely think a, the same kind of sense of wokeness um, is definitely on the right. Like we saw it. We saw it with the capital. These people think they're woke above everyone else. They think everyone's wrong. The election's fraud. Blah, blah, blah. Well, that's a good point. You mean like the QAnon woke? Like I'm awake to the reality of the deep state and how Donald Trump's gonna lead us out from all these 
you know, pedophiles and stuff like that. That's a QAnon, good QAnon, yeah. Like, yeah. The, like I would just say, wokeness lives on all the far extremes on both sides. Like, there's this sense like everyone's wrong. Even the people in my camp doesn't have it all. Like, mm -hmm. they and that's how Trump supporters feel. They feel like even even the Republican side is off. Um, so I think wokeness lives on both sides. I would say that I definitely have like with far extreme left people, I have a sense of, I have to be honest, annoyance, but I still have friends that are far left, I would say. And I still engage with them in conversations, very um, heated, but we're still friends. But I don't, and I'm not gonna say I feel bad for them because that's patronizing and I don't feel bad for them, but I feel like, wokeness is like some type of void they're trying to fill if that makes any sense like this sense of like believing in something so much because you're dying to just believe in something real it's it's i feel like they're following a religion like like a like it's like a spirituality type of thing uh, where they worship their their thoughts or their ideologies or their identities as being this or that, as being oppressed. Like, so I find it like they're lost, and I don't, and I, and I'm not, and I don't dislike them, but I'm just like, it's hard to say because they do annoy me, yeah. but it's like. It's like they they annoy me because I feel like there's some people that really are like think they're really doing good, and then I think there's people who are who are on the side of anti racism, and they just see it as a business, and they see there's a lot of clientele that they can like target their product to, and that to be woke is to always talk about the problems and the issues of race. And if you can always center that and always make people believe it's always something, there's like a supply and demand there where it's like, I'll always have wealth coming in because if I can always make them stir about this thing, I can always throw a couple books in there. I can always throw a couple seminars in there and I can make some money. Yeah, so, Ugh, that's so it's like it's it's there's levels to to wokeness. There's different sides to it. Um, it's no one's right. friend. Yeah, I think you're right though. I mean, a lot of them are atheists, and it's interesting because Peter Bogosian, who I've had on here, and he, you know, has been fighting this a lot. He wrote a book about atheism, and he's a prominent atheist, and he pushes back on this so hard because he says it manifests the same way as a religion does, except for a lot of like the beautiful tenets of a lot of religions, like forgiveness and things like that. John mm -hmm. McWhorter is writing a book on it on it right now about um like the the religious aspects of of um you know critical theory and stuff like that so i think yeah i think that we're we're seeing a lot of the same things i just yeah i just it's tough like well you as a black woman though like i watched over over the i don't know a couple months ago there was like a, a white guy in a black lives matter shirt and he was throwing a water bottle at a black woman holding her baby because she had a maga hat on and i was like well, wait a second <laughs> like like you as a black woman, there's white men that are going to say that you're wrong and you're whatever, like about race and stuff like that. That's, that, that's a weird, that's like a weird, that's a weird element of this. Like, it's almost like it doesn't have to do with race. I got into a conversation after George Floyd, there was um, a, a lot of like elevate black voices. And I was like, cool. And, uh, and then a bunch of teachers on social media were putting all these like quotes and, and, and people and, and they were all progressive, all of them, no one center or definitely no one to the right. And, and I reached out to one of them and I said, you know, when you say elevate black voices, like, why aren't you elevating anyone who's like center, like John McWhorter or, you know, right wing, like Glenn Lowry, or, you know, even like, or, you know, Thomas Sowell or something like that. And he goes, well, are they saying anything different? I was like, 
John McWhorter says anti-racism could be worse than racism. Yeah, I'd say that's freaking different. Yeah. The opposite. What do you mean? Of course they're saying things that are different. They have different points of view. And they just had no idea. It made me feel like this is an element of this woke stuff is a lot less about race and it's just about like the ideology it's the, it's the religion aspect ayan hirsi ali is bad even though she's a black immigrant woman muslim she fits all those categories but she doesn't subscribe to the idea so she's like on the outs mm -hmm. you know it's like it's, do you ever get into it with, with like white men and the, um okay i'll say this what what you're saying before with them including progressive voices i think those are voices they're just so prominent and i can just guess the names that they that was on that list mm -hmm. um not to say they should be on the list but there should be a diverse collection if you're going to uplift black voices but the thing is people that people think that if you're black you are saying like like she said well is john mcwhorter saying anything different well yeah like anyone would know he would say something completely different than a progressive but these people assume black people probably all think the same. They don't have black friends. I mean, I, I, at the end of the day, it's like, if you don't, and they mean well, but they just don't have diversity in their lives. And yeah, and they're, well, when they hear certain voices being hold up, I can, I'm guessing Kendi was on that voice or on that list. So like, if Kendi's seen as the beacon of like the black voice, then they're going to think that people that sound like him are, the ones to take seriously and to listen to and they probably never heard of john mcward i'm guessing yeah. or thomas so a lot of people don't know these people exist um and if they do they're like well they must have something wrong if black people aren't talking about them or they may have something wrong if they're not in the mainstream i'm like if they're not in the mainstream they're probably doing something right to be yeah. honest yeah. um but oh so have i had pushback with like um like with progressive white men is i'm guessing that's what you mean yeah saying like you're not you're not down for the for for black people <laughs> to be honest no. no and i'm not saying that's not gonna happen but well i wouldn't yeah i don't know i haven't and i think it's because it's and with the person i was talking to today he he's black but he says that he is liberal in some sense but i guess he said he he identifies as a republican but he says what he finds interesting about my work is as i might critique a kindy or people that on the left because i did organize a black lives matter i still have this empathy and shared like um <clears throat> like i have this this uh, how do you say it i guess yeah empathy like, I, I don't throw anyone under the bus. Like, I'm not like, um, well, I'm not, no, I don't, because I understand why people are organizing. I understand. And I'm not in, the thing is, is uh, it's not to say Black Lives Matter is unnecessary. I'm not saying that. But how it's going now is unnecessary. Like, what what's happening, like, this these other things that are, have nothing to do with Black Lives, like that man throwing a bottle at a Black woman. Um, that in itself is is kind of the imagery of why it, this doesn't work mm -hmm. because if the black people aren't wearing a black lives matter shirt you assume that they can be tossed aside that they're not black that their life doesn't matter black lives matter all black lives matter you don't get to choose especially if you're someone that's not black and you're within this organization like the portland issues that was an incident with them telling people to put up their fists if they were for black people if they weren't the white supremacists yeah. those were a lot of white people a lot of white allies and blm shirts destroying stuff and yes there's a lot of other uh races but it was a lot of white people out there doing that i'm like you don't care about black people you don't care about black lives because if you did you would realize this behavior is going to backfire on people that look like me and on the organization, it's not gonna backfire on you because when they hear Black Lives Matter riot or Black Lives Matter, you know, attacks a diner, they're going to think black person. The people that do not see what's going on are gonna assume 
It's black people doing it again, of course, because they're violent. So that's why I don't believe a lot of people like that man that threw that bottle. I think there's a lot of them in this organization who are only doing this for their own life. To put that BLM shirt on and to act like he cares about black people makes him feel good about himself. Yeah. It's an ego thing. And if he was thinking at all, wanted to throw something at a pregnant, at a woman with a baby, like, who are you? And then Black Lives Matter, you black, like what? Does that make any sense? Um, but have I got pushback? I've got pushback actually because people assume that if I, if I critique, you know, uh, say what I just said, the incident, yeah, then you're that people, then, then people can go on underneath. Yeah. They're Marxist little, yeah, they're racist. Yeah. They're, and I'll be like, and I'll shut them down. Yeah. And I, and, and I see that people like, great people are retweeting me and that's great. But then some people will retweet me and then put their own commentary to almost like kind of change up what I said in a way of like, they want to say the thing, but they need a black person to like vouch. Like they couldn't say that tweet alone, Yeah. but they're like, see, I, this black person said this about Kendi. And then this is what I really think about Kendi. And it's like, it like, like I gave them a base to like have some, some um, weight in the game. And I'm like, I, I might be considered a heterodox person. I'm still black and I still do identify as a black person with my ethnic sense. And I'm not someone's heterodox Negro. And I'm sorry if that's, I can't say that word on here, but I'm not. Like James Baldwin said, I am not your Negro. I'm not your heterodox Negro. You're not going to use me and tout me around like she's going to be the person that I'm going to reshare and I'm going to tell. No, yeah. because I am still fighting for my community in a way where I do amplify certain things going on with, with black organizations because I do believe in a lot of the work that's happening. Um, but there's other work that I'm like, yo, this is backfiring on us. Like this is actually hurting us. When I see black organizations back in critical race theory, I do say this is not helping. This is not gonna help. Like this is actually going to make, this is curating racism. Like yeah. this is fostering it. And am I listening to you all the time? No. Do I say it though? Yeah. Um, but I get pushed back when I don't say the thing that certain people think I should say because I'm a heterodox independent thinker. I'm like, that's, <laughs> that's what an independent thinker is. It's like, yeah. <laughs> I like, I don't understand what you like, particularly my last uh, podcast I did on Capitol Hill you know, um, I feel like that was not, oh, that, that shouldn't have been a, a partisan, it, like, that should have been a bipartisan, like, that was just wrong. Like, what happened there was wrong. And that shouldn't even be a side debate. And it's funny, I'm, and I put in the podcast, the first thing I said, I'm like, I could easily denounce what was happening in Portland and in Washington, D.C. with certain Black Lives Matter chapters. I had no problem doing it. Why is it so hard for people to, to denounce people taking over the U.S. Capitol? But you are the same people who say you do not do the identity politics game. You're center, you're center and you're independent and you're critical thinkers. And you look at stuff objectively. No, you don't. Like, you still are identifying with not being a certain color or on a certain side or whatever and, and you're masquerading like i was kind of calling out because i'm so sick of it like i'm i'm so sick of people that are clearly believe in ideology but to but shield themselves from backlash by saying they're they're in the center no, I, I can't be like this because I'm a sinner person. No, you're a freaking, you're more right wing than the right wing. Like, and the fact that, and I got pushback on that video um, and I didn't care. I said, my channel isn't here to cater to feelings or that's the problem is that commentators and certain journalists 
create stuff to get fans and they're not giving you the truth i don't care i'm gonna say the truth and if it hurts your feelings well you know i'm sorry well, but that's why but, people, i think are turning tuning into you you know i'm really actually really glad that you said what you did um about how you're not here to be a mouthpiece for ideas because i i get why people want that because i have ideas that are very um aligned and when i hear you know coleman hughes or john mcwhorter or you say something it's like oh yeah you're like people will listen to you when they wouldn't listen to me and i get like the temptation of people to be like so i'm doing this hey Brittany, is this cool is this cool just get your stamp just get your your black woman stamp i understand why people do that and i get why that's not the game to play at the end of the day, what we do is we just try to interact with each other as much as possible. And I try to open this up to a bunch of different perspectives and people of different races, people of different ideas, people of different, um, you know, walks of life to try and understand it. That's the whole point of, you know, perspectives and the perspectives will just get really, really, once you, once you start to see all these different ones, you'll understand the human experience better, you know, and I've had on you know, um, like I, I really like like uh, like Killer Mike. I, I had on Tesla Figaro, who I really like too. Um, but like Killer Mike is someone who's like you know pushing for like you know black causes and stuff like that, but in a very different way. He's kind of harder to box in and things like that. He's very progressive, but he's not like in the woke crew and stuff like that. There's all these different ways to try and and you know you know fix the problems, the racial problems that we have in society. And I'm trying to interview and talk to as many people and form networks with as many people as possible so I can try and get the best ideas. Mm -hmm. But I, I, get, I get the temptation of white people to, to want that stamp. And I, yeah. I talk about race openly. And people are like, how are you able to do that? Straight heterosexual, you know, or <laughs> um, straight white man, <laughs> all this stuff. And it's like, cause I'm, I'm oh. curious. And I just, I just, I, I'm, I'm too logical to buy into like, racist like racist ideas so if i make a mistake then it's like oh cool then i made a mistake but i, I like having those conversations a lot and I, i'm really glad that yeah. you're um willing to come here and have this conversation and we already did over an hour um but i really appreciate it where can people tune into um see find your your youtube channel but also read your work and stuff like that because i think i'm hoping um, that people will think like me, which is like, I want, I like following your process. Here's where you're at. And you said you're only like a year into this crazy, you know, down the rabbit hole, like Alice in Wonderland. And you're, you're making these, these like judgments and calls and figuring stuff out. And I think it'll be really cool to watch that develop more and more and more, given your background, given your experience, given your education in journalism and stuff like that. Where can people find you? So on YouTube, you can find me at hashtag American Shade with Brittany King. And then on Twitter, um, King Talissa, T-A-L-I-S-S-A. -S -S -A. Um, you can find my work. If you just type in Brittany Talissa King, a lot of my pieces come up. But if you want to find my work, that's kind of actually kind of time stamps my process, which I kind of have looked back on. Um, on my Medium page. Uh, what is that? If you type in Brittany Tulsa King, I'm sure it'll pop up. I don't know, like, my I'll actual put it in the username. Show notes. Yeah. Along. Yeah. But I've, through that, I, I post a lot of pieces that were published by other publications and then things that I wanted just to keep whole for myself. But you can see kind of my process of me saying an idea very clear because that's where I am at that moment. Yeah. And then I might write something else that's like, okay. I not, didn't necessarily misstep, but I have learned and garnered more information. Okay, I'm going in again on this thing. Okay, I'm going to go in, or I'm going in again. And it's like this thing that I didn't realize it was time stamping, but someone told me like, I'm seeing your thoughts play out on this medium page where I see you are sincere here. But then I see that you're like, oh wait, look, I just saw, oh wait. And I'm like, dang, I didn't even realize that. And so, one would say, well, would you not want to delete those things because it's not like completely centered with what you are here now? I'm like, well, no, because in those pieces, I might not agree with everything now, but there are things I agree with. And two, it shows it's, it's okay. real. Yeah. That's how people think. People you don't, that. you start somewhere. That's yeah. where I started. So yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm like catching you like on your like rise, which I'm like happy about. Like, but you know, as like a, 
if you know i have no doubt if you pursue it that you could be like a public intellectual that's like in a lot of important conversations and be, it's gonna be really cool to look back at how did this happen because we look at these brilliant people in the world jordan peterson or something like that and you're like well, I can't relate to that, that like super genius type. But if you go back to like, you know, a 25 year old Jordan Peterson and look at his work, I bet it'd be real. I'd be fascinated to see it. Yes. Like, oh, oh, I how would did he get there. You know, like how exactly. did he get to that spot? Yes. You know? I would love to see if he had a medium page. That'd be dope. Well, but we yeah, that with, with technology. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for staying. I know it's late on the East Coast. So thank you so much for doing this. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed the conversation. I hope other people did too. Me too. Thank you for having me. This is fun. Yeah, sure.